Welcome to This Commerce Life. We are an unscripted podcast dedicated to small businesses and entrepreneurs in the retail and consumer packaged goods space in Canada and the United States. I am Phil Chang, co-host and co-founder. And I'm Kenny Venucci, co-host and co-founder of This Commerce Life. Our love is the journey to retail and our passion is sharing that with you every week. And you're never interrupting. That's the yeah. thing. <laughs> and quite frankly, we don't care anyway. I'll, we'll just keep talking around you. We'll just say, listen, shut up for a second. Go do something. we got to talk. Uh, actually, you'll appreciate this conversation. We're, we're having a conversation about a client, um, and we've started their marketing campaigns, right? So we've started doing content. We'll get to the details, all boy, because they're going to know. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're, you know, so we've started doing some stuff. And like with everything content is, everybody has something to say about content, right? So when you're not producing content, nobody has a comment, right? You start producing content, everyone wants, you know, there's a grammar check, there's all these things, you know, it's not um, 100% accurate, or um, it could be, you know, it could be this way or that way, right? And so we are working through those first bumpy things with a client where they're going, I don't love the music in this video. And you're like, got it, no problem. We could fix the video but you need to give me something I can hear, right? Because I don't like the music, it's not constructed. Like I can't, as a creative guy, there's nothing I can do with that, right? You need to, you know, tell me there's a Taylor Swift song that you love and I can this go figure out like what, this, it, you know, right? what it feels like so I can go yeah. figure it out. This and doesn't then, feel like me. Well, what feels like you? Right. <laughs> tell me the song that feels like Corwin. If you've got a song that actually, like you, you tell yeah. me the song. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Thunderstruck by ACDC. <laughs> and you know what? Then that's fine. And that's the yeah, song we yeah, can yeah. use. Yeah. Or a version yeah. of because we may yeah. have to pay royalties yeah. on that song. Well, you know, the adage where, you know, the do it does your spouse use the go with the red dress, or go with the black dress. And yeah. whichever one you pick, they go with the other one. Exactly. Yeah. At least you have something to go with. Yeah. But you know, yeah. Phil, the uh, social content is one of those things where I think one of the mistakes as marketers that we make and even as clients make too, is that we kind of over cherish it. Like I'm not saying it's paper on the bottom of the bird cage, but yeah. don't, you know, it's about a journey. It's about a story, a narrative that has right. a long tail. It's not, you know, some, yes, some content is sticky. Some content, you know, is around for a while or it's really poignant. And it's like, it's sort of a, it's a milestone that they really need to announce something, whatever. But if it isn't something of that, you know, gravitas, then it's like, you know what? Just share, uh, but don't cherish it. <laughs> Just yeah. keep going. Let it go, man. Yeah. Just hit, hit, hit yeah. this post button and move on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, try to watch your spelling. Try to watch your grammar. Make sure you don't go no, off. You, you, off you can't, off. You can't right. come across as a two-bit organization. So that's right. 100% right, right? But sure. And then you need to stay on brand. But after that, you know, it's okay. Like we, what we're trying to do is make an impression. We're trying to create some waves and then we're going to keep going. Right. So, so we're just laughing, right? I, I like how you said you know. stay on brand. Whenever someone t says that to me, I say, well, tell me, talk to me about your brand. What have you documented? Where have you gone? Have you gone to the, you know, hard places and really crafted what your brand looks like, feels like, yeah. sounds like, how does it live out in the market? If that's been identified, cool but if it hasn't been written down and it hasn't been validated or vetted or kind of worked on then it isn't then it's a process it's a journey and you will steer a moving ship but if it's been documented cool then yeah. you know everyone should have done their homework yeah. but if it isn't then yeah. you know and how many of the company sizes we're dealing with no no like, like I, I think half the company half the people that listen to us just ran away right because they're all like oh no <laughs> you know what's funny look what midday squares did they went reality tv show right and they went raw and yeah they're throw they throw some marketing spin at and they do a lot now but when they started they just turned the cameras on yeah, yeah, yeah. and their brand and this is where a lot of emerging cpg founders i think you know if they can find their way kind of through the emotional chaos of it if People want to connect with them because they are the right. brand. As right. much as they love right. their brand name and their product and whatever, people are sort of buying into them. How many times does someone try something, a product, because they know the founder, right? right? It's that yeah. personal connection. Right. So there's a lot to be said for an emerging brand. It very well may be just an extension of the human. So how does that human communicate and connect with consumers in a believable way? Right. And sometimes 
some founders are not charismatic, right? Most are like, look at our, um, I was just listening to your guys' episode with, um, um, uh, naked and saucy. Oh my gosh. Brain oh, fade. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Right. Paul's like, guys, I'm an operator. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to kill it on social. Like, what is this thing? So he knows, but you know, so it is what it is. And that's totally fine. However, a lot of people still know Paul and Paul still is out there sharing his story. He still resonates with people. People still want to be like, I get that guy. That guy gets me. He's made something that my family can enjoy because of allergies or whatever. Like there's this personality behind a lot of what we do and in business is business. Sure. But business is personal, especially for most of us and in food. Oh my gosh. It's so personal. I think so. I yeah. think it's all about it's all about the touch and feel, and I think it goes back to your your main point. There is, you know, what if I ask ninety nine out of the hundred brands, tell me your story and identify and all that stuff, there is nothing there. So, quite frankly, the stuff you're doing just to get it going and the authenticity is your brand at that point. Stop telling me what it should look like when nobody's ever done anything to tell me what it should look like. Mm-hmm. Right? It doesn't yeah. work that way. You start going, you start developing. We, on the agency side, we always come across um, brands who, you know, we say, well, do you have a brand guide? Can you share with us the work that's been yeah, done yeah. on your brand to date? And they give you a logo kit. Yeah. Like, oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's a, okay. That's one piece of the puzzle. What, <laughs> what other, what other work? And if they haven't done the work, that's fine. And, and it's you no know, big deal. but you just like, it's no big deal. It takes time to work through that. Exactly. And I will say that a lot of emerging brands, they feel the pressure to have all that stuff done up front. Uh, well, for those that are aware yeah. of, you know, where the opportunity, you know, they feel like, oh, I got to have it all really dialed in. Um, just being aware that you have, for example, like a gap in your voice and you don't really know how, how to pr- like really say what's great and important right. and unique and um, as differentiator about your brand, but you still work towards it. Like, right. don't just ignore it. Just go like, Oh, like when we talk about our product, we talk about some people talk about sugar. Some people talk about fiber and some people talk yeah. about, you know, format right. and it's kind of different to everybody. Okay. Well, what are the things that are really going to help us cut through? And that takes time to go yeah. through, or you bring in people to help bring clarity to that faster. But um, yeah, it's uh, boy, we just jumped into the diving <laughs> branding, oh, we, and <laughs> yeah, we we got yeah, right into it. Always do it. We're in it. I love it. Well, plus you just caught us, like we were just laughing yeah. at it, okay, going through it, and thinking. I said, "Listen, you know what? We're just like you know, I mean, because we're posting. You know what? It, it's a um, work in progress, and it, it it'll change as it, it changes." An iterative thing, right? Like Never. especially when you like so so this this brand has a few things. They've got a brand kit. They've got a style guide. You know, they've got elements of a brand voice that we've you know that we sort of it sort of still works because they haven't worked on it in a few years right so they've got a handful of things but it is kind of like there's this like itch to move and then there's this itch to make everything perfect right and so we kind of went look we're not sitting around right like we're not we're not a great big organization that needs to make everything perfect right now we need to move and we need to iterate so we can actually hear you know like because responses help you with did we get that right did we get the right audience right like there's all those things that help you adjust along the way so anyway we're i'm always amazed at how how campy um some of the best social content is the content that really gets people asking questions and giving attaboys and sharing it and watching it six times. It's often the stuff that is unproduced. That is just, you know, there's no graphics. It's just, you know, up the nose, cell phone cam, you know, in a grocery store or in a production facility or, you know, in the, in the warehouse. So it's one of those things, you know, Corey, when someone says, you know what, Holy shit, I just did that. Or I was just there. That's what I saw. Oh my God. That's what I did. Those Mm -hmm. are the ones. I think that's why people related so well to Jake when he was doing so much on midday. Yeah. Right. If you meet Jake, Jake is that person to large, to large degree. Like he's just Jake. Yeah. You know well, I mean, he his, I love his, I like how he's identified his role as rainmaker. He's just, yeah. he's just like, I- I'm going to champion midday squares. I'm going to connect people. I'm going to make friends. He's a professional friend maker. Yeah, he's a good friend maker. <laughs> I love it. It's yeah. awesome. Are you kidding? It's really awesome. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, we're like 10 minutes in. So the voice you hear is Corwin, um, Corwin Hebert, and we are super excited to have him back. He's already been on the show. 
Um, but um, Corwin came back, and I think we um, we had you come on to do something very specific, but we just kind of love having you around. So um, yes, I don't remember what it was. No, no, I remember, I remember, but oh, um, remember yeah, yeah, I remember. But but um, like before we get, because Corwin's got some news, he's he's got some cool things that you guys need to pay attention to. I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew who it was. So um, Corwin, if you don't remember, he was on. He's he's the VP of partnerships or strategic partnerships at Ethical Food Group, um, and so he was on last time. And clearly, we we. Um, us, Corwin, we have some strong opinions on marketing stuff. Um, you know, imagine that. Um, but you, we wanted, um, we asked you to come back on because you are also, um, you have launched a podcast. Yes. I have. Um, and so we're, um, we're excited about that. We wanted to get you on, have you talk about that, um, find out what's going on there, what, what you're after. Um, so our audience knows who, who you are and, and, why they should be listening to you too. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly why. I, I mean, when we started talking about me coming back, I'm like, what, what would I say? And like, oh yeah, right. Let's talk about the podcast. It, uh, the last time we talked, I was just a few months in over at ethical food group and was having a, having a riot, still having a riot. So, I mean, I'm, I'm backed by seven agencies with 140 people across Western Canada. It's, it's so fun and I get to beat my sustainability chest <laughs> as loud and proudly as I can. Uh, and I really enjoy that. And on the side of my desk, off the side of my desk is I'm doing a podcast called aisle 42. And I know you guys have heard it maybe slices and dices here and there. Yeah. And it has been a ride and I'll tell you why um, I'm going after the consumers. I'm building slowly and awkwardly. <laughs> I'm building a podcast for people who go grocery shopping and people who give a damn about what they shop for and what they feed themselves and their families, people that look at labels, people that care about farmers and they care about the food system in some version, some, you know, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot. So it's the conscious consumer that I'm building this podcast for. And it has been so fun. It has been so rewarding. We launched November 14th. We are 17 episodes in and the, I don't know, you guys have been podcasting forever. Like, what are you, like 9,000? No, what are you at, 400 episodes or something no, crazy? 300, 353 this week. Oh it's my posted gosh. and then there's about uh, seven or eight that are recorded. It's roughly like, like one a week for like six years, basically. It That's has been one a week. It's, it yeah. works up to one a week since November 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. remarkable. I love it. The certainly, I mean, I made some mistakes early on. One of which was I pre-recorded a whole bunch because I was so nervous that I wasn't going to get people to come on the show. Yeah. And I didn't want to, you know, because you know, when you do things off the side of your desk, you're yeah. like, what if I lose track and I get busy and then it falls away. And we all know podcasting is like a radio signal. If you go dark or you have any interruptions, they you know, it gets, you kind of get lost in the shuffle. So I knew that I had to keep the once a week signal strong. So I pre-recorded a bunch to the point where, you know, I was doing a recording in like December with someone and I knew that their episode wasn't going to go live until like April. And it's, it dawned on me. I'm like, first off in CPG four or five months, it's like a it's lifetime, eternity. right? Their business could be gone. It could be different. Yeah. They could have a totally new product line. Yeah. You know, they might have moved facilities. They might have changed countries. They might have married, divorced, had kids, whatever. Like just so <laughs> much stuff can change. Yeah. And these moments, like you guys experience in your podcast, these these conversations can be really enlightening. They can be encouraging. Sometimes there can be, you know, things that kind of get unearthed that maybe are a little harder to talk about or whatever it is. And and so I realized that oh, I'm not really honoring the connection. I'm not really honoring the the, the friendship the way I want to. And, and that, because that gap is just too far mm -hmm. and too far mm -hmm. away. So that was one of the mistakes I made early on. So I'm finally, I'm getting close to the end of that backlog. <laughs> I hope to be able to have a, a lot faster turnaround um, with, with people now that, you know, everything's going, but Phil, I know you're, you're on the production end of this yes. podcast, right? Yeah. So yeah. You know, it's funny, I, I've done a bunch of podcasting production and work for other people. This is the first time that I have hosted a show. I've always wanted to host my own podcast for the longest time, but I always promised myself I wouldn't say it out loud until I was doing it because yeah. 
how many times have you heard people say, I, I want to do a podcast? Yeah. yeah. A million people say, I want to do a podcast. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be one of those people. I'm not going to say it out loud until I'm actually doing it. And the doing part, there's a lot of things to do, especially early on, like to launch a podcast, all the little bits, all the little yeah. production bits, the decisions around, yeah. oh, do I do an intro? Do I do a, like a, a snippet from later on in the interview to start? Do I do what kind of, what bumpers, what music, what format, how long should they be? Like I sort of, you know, really wrestled with all these things. I started to go down the path of, well, I'll learn about podcasting. Like I'll sort of expose myself to the, you know, the, uh, the education side of podcast podcasting and learn from other people that do it. And I'm like, I, after about, I don't know, maybe a couple articles and a couple of podcasts about podcasting. I'm like, you know what? I don't care what anyone else. I'm going to do oh. what I feel <laughs> like I can do yeah. and, and, and yeah. just do it. But putting it out there is uh, it has been one of those things where I'm really proud to talk about the podcast. I know you guys are, you see you guys talking with all your industry friends and you're just so proud yeah. to be like, come on the show. Like let's talk. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's a remarkable gift, I think. And that's where I really, what really drove me to launch a podcast is, I mean, I'm in, I'm an agency and, and some VC world, right? So, you know, there's a, a lot that I can talk about. There's a lot I can do, but the relationships that I'm building for the sake of us helping people, it, those are long conversations. These are not quick decisions that get made, especially yeah. if there's equity on the table. It's like, these are long, the, the, if you want to call it the sales process, if you will, or sort of yeah. the journey, yeah. it's, it's sophisticated <laughs> and it takes time and there's a lot of decisions and not everyone's in the buying or partner mood. So you kind of have to just earn their respect over time. But a podcast is a way that I can help. It's the, and you guys do it all the time. You're like, well, let's, whatever we can do to help come on the show, right. we're going to champion. So I'm enjoying that and having it as this podcast being for their, hopefully their ideal consumer is actually really exciting because it then gives them an opportunity to kind of put their sales hat on and say, yeah, you know, talk about what excites them about what their product is and does. And especially when we're talking about regenerative practices, we're talking about organic, we're talking about plastic free, we're talking about B Corp certifications or plastic neutral, get to talk about some of these good for people on planet stuff. It gets really, really exciting. So that was a really long rant, but I'm, well, I'm having a riot. Well, we a hundred percent. Like, I, I think like that's one of the things that excites us the most about being able to do this, right? One is we, we still get to talk to each other every week, which we still love after six years, which I'm kind of surprised about. Me too. Um, you know, but, um, but at the same time, like, it's also like what is super cool about what you're doing that we do sort of, but we don't, we talk to the, we talk to industry folks, right? And we, we tell industry folks about other industry folks, right? So there's a lot of, you know, kind of connections we're making there. We do get consumers that go, hey, I heard that and I went out and bought that, which is super cool, right? But we don't, we don't do as much of that. And I feel like just, there's so many brands, particularly the ones that are doing some sort of social good or like environmental good that, it's hard to get that. You know what I mean? Like, cause you, you, yeah. you're spending all of your time, money, marketing product benefits and, and why we're the best at what we do and all those things. By the time you get to, Oh, by the way, we're also really good for the planet or we're doing no harm to the planet or we're, there's no money left. There's no voice left. Right. So I think um, what you're doing is also really amazing because it helps these brands, um, you know, just like, help them spread the word that they are really making a difference. Right. So I really love that. Like I love, I love, love, love that. I appreciate you saying that. I think a yeah. little bit to, to those brands defense, sometimes, especially in their category, things like sustainability, the category driver, you know, drivers above sustainability are all pretty notable, right? You yeah. know, it's format or price yeah. or convenience or, you know, you kind of name it. And so, you know, the, for some audiences, sustainability is kind of coming up in the consideration set. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's just a little further down. So I understand. Um, in fact, there's some brands that, you know, they really lean into their sustainability messaging as a way of differentiating themselves on, mm -hmm. on at the shelf level. And, and that's mm -hmm. great. But sometimes that messaging can actually get in the way. And, you know, that's one of the things we find is sometimes it's like, okay, we have to save that. And you kind of said it. Sometimes we have to save that piece of the puzzle yeah. for a different format or a different medium right. or it sort of, you know, treated a little bit differently. But 
the brands that are trying to do good things for people and planet, that sounds like a bumper sticker, but uh, <laughs> those that are doing it, you know, they're doing it because that's, that's them. Those are their values yeah. and they're imposing their values on their brand because yeah. they feel it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And so when they do get to talk about it, they get really excited. They, they get, get really excited, passionate. Right? They get a little angry. Like yeah. it's emotional and allowing consumers the chance to hear that I think is very, very powerful. Yeah, I, I, agree. I, I, I want to, I want to clarify too, though, like when I say that brands, they run out of money, I, I really mean that like in some cases you look at these brands and they are in super competitive categories and things like that. And so sometimes it's it's um as much good that you're doing, but there's still some realities to the way you run your business. Right. Which is I've got to advertise. I've got to get I've got to I've got to get people to buy stuff before I can talk about everything. And that does mean that sometimes the social good stuff you just you run you run out of time you run out of voice you run out of money and it's not that the brand doesn't want to do it it's just you don't you know there's only so much time there's only so much or money they don't know yeah. how to talk about it yeah. right sometimes they don't know how to talk about it. i think um christy o'leary from decade impacts calls them green blushers right where they just they either they don't know how or they're not quite sure the yeah. best path forward or they're yeah pardon me or they're shy about it like they don't want to brag they don't want to be yeah. that that um virtue signal type type person or or brand so they kind of hold back yeah. um so yeah that it is a bit of a tricky uh you know path to navigate but i think giving giving them a voice now through the podcast um and doing it for in front of consumers like an audio you know sampling demo if you will uh it's it's been an interesting journey so yeah I haven't had a hard time booking people. They, it's been relatively easy to, because uh, I do the outreach. Just no one really yeah. knew, especially early on, no one knew about the podcast. Yeah. So I reached out to people and I'd say about, and these are like a lot of these people I didn't have a relationship with before. So they're like, they've never heard of me. They've never heard of Ethical Food Group. They don't know anything about who I am or what we're doing. And I send them a cold email and saying, I really think you should come on the show and here's why I got like an 85% response rate. That's, that's a, huge. that's a, that's a cold really? email. That's, that's a cold huge. email. And I think for anyone in any version of business development or sales, you get 85% response of rate, anything. a successful response rate, like as in booking in my calendar with one yeah. click, like that's, that shows you that they need a voice and they want that connection with 100%. the consumer. So. Yeah. Listen, you can't get 85% from our friends. Do you know what I mean? Never mind a stranger. So what is it? You never you? reply so, my emails. I'm kidding. <laughs> but like, Come sort on, of Kenny. It's not, it's no, he's not kidding. run out of money. You know what, guys? So people want to tell. People are passionate about their brands, and they need an avenue. And not every avenue has to come with a dollar sign. And that's where this medium becomes really cool, and, and what, what you're doing is important. I mean, you got to give people a chance he to didn't tell. Think he wasn't thing. open to sponsorships. What are you trying to close all the doors for him? Like, come on, Kenny. Like, hey, you gotta, you gotta do some some gratis work at the beginning. <laughs> right. Let, let's talk about sponsorships for a second. So, the uh, I don't know. Do you guys still look at the stats of your podcast? Do you ever sort of pay attention? I yeah. maybe because I'm so new in it, I still like pay attention to these things, but. Uh, we just uh, we're coming up on 2000 downloads all time. And I tell you, man, that is, I, I didn't know the first thousand took a while, a while, a while. It took, you know, three months. And then the last thousand took a, you know, a couple of weeks, two, three. So it's yeah. growing quickly, but awesome. it's uh, it, thank you. But it's the, the sponsorship game. Like you have to have in order to command, like, Hey, other company, give us money to, you know, have your, have your, spotlight on our show consistently like that is you have to have some serious numbers so yeah. I, I don't know because you guys are an industry show so uh you're probably categorized more in the business and marketing okay. um categories yep. uh, i'm in that category but as sort of a i'm the bastard child over there i'm in i'm in food so i'm up yeah. against the so aisle 42 is up against um, bon Appetit and Gastropod and Ooh. like all the big, all the big food industry, you know, players. And it is, it is hard, like Eater Magazine and Publishing House. Like there's just, I'm up against all these dogs. So uh, what I have discovered is that I actually care. <laughs> I actually care when, when I go from like 144th in 
food podcasts in Canada to 15th. I care. Yeah. And then when I drop down to 48th and then I drop down to 212th yeah. and I jump up to, you know, 17th, like these things, I have yeah. to stop caring because I can't, you know, whatever, but it's just, it's personal. You stop, <laughs> I want you people stop, to love you, the show. We have stopped looking for those reasons. Just him. So I don't tell him when people really unsubscribe. Like he gets upset. Wait, where did it go? Why do you unsubscribe? Right? Why do so you he's always like, show me, show me who. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not. No, no. Just you know what? Don't worry about it. It's all good. Nobody and unsubscribe. I'm like if we're if <laughs> Nobody, we're twelfth one, like, if we're 12th one month and we drop to fiftieth, like what happened? Like yeah. where did everybody go? But we we still watch. We watch the numbers a lot. Like I don't think we um. I so have we averaging. So we were averaging um, four to five thousand downloads an episode. We weren't we weren't asking for sponsors. Yeah, it felt weird, right? Like it felt weird to ask for it because we didn't we didn't think that we. And even now, like we we have a couple of like really great sponsors that oh, that come back, right? And they're amazing, and they see value in it. And sometimes it's still weird for us, right? Like we. There are moments that we kind of. I go, don't think it was ever. It was the intention was never to 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 monetize it to cover expenses. Yeah, was all was was always in the back because you don't want to take things out of your own pocket if you don't have to. But it wasn't necessary to make. You know, it, it wasn't necessary to make trillions. It was. Yeah. It wasn't the purpose of it. We never intended. We like to talking to each other, and we think the industry needed. Yeah. People to talk about it. no different than what you're doing, Corey. It's just I think there's you know there's not. We're, we're obliged to help people. We've been around long enough. We go, we're in spots where we can help. I think you got to give people a chance to tell their stories and give them a chance to have voice and go out and do things. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, at that point, then it becomes like, well, I mean, yeah, you'd like to get paid for it, but, you know, should you or, you know, at least cover the expenses, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you want to create opportunities for people. And, that's what it's sort of about, right? And if you can if you can do that with you know without spending too much money, I think that's ideal. Um, exactly. But uh, yeah, it's it's a wild ride. I I was just sitting there. I sat down with a a producer, audio producer friend of mine last night, Joel Armstrong, and he was talking about YouTube and kind of showing how the new YouTube podcasting sort of framework, how they're sort of yeah. getting how Google's getting podcasts yeah. out there. It's like. And I, I record video uh, for our shows, but we haven't released the video content just yet. Um, and looking at how, like we threw, I threw the RSS feed into YouTube. Uh, what was it? When they did the big switch over somewhere in the last few weeks. Yep. And it's already getting, you know, some traction. And I'm, I didn't do anything. And they're just audio files, you know, playing with album art. Like it's not, yeah. this is whatever. But people yeah. are searching, right? And YouTube puts things into people's feeds when it feels like it. So I, you, you know, very quickly, he was kind of showing me some yeah. podcasts that are really busy on YouTube. I'm like, Oh, I get it. So even if I have just like static talking heads, you know, footage, like splicing and dicing it six ways to heaven and getting it up there, you know, is going to create more opportunities for more people to watch it. And I, I think I'm intrigued by it. It's, it's one of those things like, Oh, did, did I just add like an hour or two of work per week on this? <laughs> I have to be careful, yeah. but, um, but it's all worth it uh, because getting in front of consumers is, is what I want to do. So yeah, yeah it's yeah. tricky, but fun. That's all cool. Huh? That's, That's all cool. cool. Yeah. I, I, I haven't checked. I haven't checked ours. There's kind of not enough time, but I did the, I saw the thing and then I loaded my RSS feed in there too, but I don't, I didn't check to see. I didn't check to see if it did anything. So I should probably go look. One of my hopes is to, and, and I think the experience I had at CHFA in Toronto when when uh, Rick Williams and I sat down with Kyle Marsham um, for his podcast because he had a podcasting booth yeah, in his right. trade show row, right for the broker yeah. in Greenfresh, and uh, and I really loved it. And I, if I'm mis- not mistaken, our episode was the only episode he recorded at the trade show that went live um maybe because being a broker at a trade show is actually a lot of work and he was you know and, and he was probably extremely busy probably busier than he than he realized he was going to be but i love the idea of aisle 42 having 
like a recording booth at the planted shows at like yeah. consumer shows yeah. where there's yeah. food brands and yeah. you know people doing good things for the planet, like kind of talking about the food broken food system and who, which who is fixing it at some of these consumer shows. I, I love CHFA um, and, and, you know, and maybe an expo, of course, who wouldn't, but I'm not sure if that's where I'd want to be with the show, just given that it it's tends to be, it's, yeah, it's, it's all industry stuff. And it's I think trade. that there's a, there's a, you know, I, we meet and connect with a lot of these people because they're our friends and clients yeah. and, and, and industry people. But when it comes to the consumer, I think I'd rather be like at the outdoor, you know, at the outdoor show and have a, have a podcast booth. Where we're I think talking that's where you need to be. You're a consumer yeah, show. Yeah. The other's trade. I mean, yeah, we're all consumers, mm-hmm. but that's definitively, those are trade shows. Mm-hmm. Those are industry. Consumers aren't allowed into those shows. Yeah. Again, outside of the fact we're all consumers, but yeah, your your place would be totally cool in a like the you know the veggie expos and plant expos or mm-hmm. whatever expo. I those would be a blast. Yeah, totally. I'd love to do. Oh, speaking, of, have you guys space rabbit? What? What? Is what? It, it's space vegan freeze dried ice cream. I think it's out of a um, out of an ice cream shop that was in Gastown or Chinatown or something like that. Okay. Anyway, so Space Rabbit, I, I've picked it up. <laughs> is it not, like, it's, I've never heard of it. Like, is this in it's, stores? It's, you know what? I was at, there's a little cafe at like Quebec and 11th called the Federal Store. Yeah, I know and, the one. Yeah. And they would, it, it's, it was, it's merchandised at $9. <laughs> This little treat. Um, but I saw it and I just thought, you know what? Sometimes you just need something fun. And so I bought Space Rabbit yesterday and I'm excited yeah. to try freeze dried vegan ice cream. They local? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Who's the company? Say Hello Sweets out of Vancouver. That's kind of cool, though. Yeah. Federal Store's got some cool shit in it, eh? I love that kind of shopping. Yeah, I love I that just small curated, you yeah, know, really gorgeous espresso, like, wonderful food. You yeah. know, you there's, uh, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. So brands like Salt Spring Kitchen, yeah, you yeah. know, get merchandised in a little store like that. I don't know, you know, how quickly the product moves off a shelf like that, but um, but I appreciate it, and I do buy some things once in a while from them. I know it's a bit more of a novelty buy or a little bit more of a gift style kind of shopping well, or- it, though, buddy you're on 11th and main you know real estate is super expensive rents are super expensive and you're trying to do something pretty cool and offer you know little oddball brands and give them a chance it's pretty it's pretty slick it's pretty neat right yeah. they're lucky because that street can support that sort of eclectic uh kind of uh kind of play to it right mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's well, pretty cool that's pretty cool love that's it cool. I love it. Um, so you've got, you've got, um, it's true. I've, I was looking, you've got some, some cool folks on there. I mean, um, some of these guys we've had before, like Analia Krebs, um, we're going to be walking um, Choxo's plant with Peter Higgins. So that'll be super fun. Nice. Um, Fada we had on. Um, but yeah, there's a, oh, and then Natasha Vandenkirk. But, you know, like we have like what we love and I love that you're doing this too. Like, cause I think like all of these guys make impact for us um, and that they're impactful on, on everything that we do. But the uh, both Sheena Russell made with local and three farmers that you had on both of those made like very different impressions. Like we talk about Natasha and three farmers a lot, right? Because we look at what's in our industry and you kind of go, why like we have this amazing farmer you know with with her dad like her family and all these sort of things why don't we have more of these folks or where are all these folks that are like these guys out there that consumers need to know about right do you know what i mean like so i just Mm -hmm. think um yeah i i I really love i think that's the the cool play about it that's why like i mean ideally i mean not ideally but like there's so many of, of the ones like if you if you had Hopcock Farms on, for example, like for our side, it was more we were talking about sort of the the the, the production end and the the slaughterhouse, blah blah, all that all that stuff. Where you are driving consumers into these stores, we're talking to consumers about these. Like 
I love the fact that so many of the people we talk to are the same people you could talk to. It's just a, you flip in the angle. Mm-hmm. Like we are talking to typically more about how the brand goes, how to get it going, what you're doing, why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and the important part is there needs to be another person on the other with cash in hand. Yeah. Be willing to buy this because otherwise it's just a great story that'll mm-hmm. be on one episode well, and it's gone because the consumer is not there. There is no story. You guys just said it. And when I, when I started planning for aisle 42, I literally thought I got to make sure I don't just replicate what Kenny and Phil are doing. Yeah. And some of the other, there's a few others, four or five other podcasts yeah, that are sort of in yeah. our industry. And I'm like, you know what? The industry side is done is good. We're good there. And we yeah. all, a lot of us listen to what you guys do in some of the other shows too. But when uh, when I start these recording sessions, and you know how it's like when you just jump onto a recording, and maybe it's someone that you don't really know very well, so you're sort of like, oh, you wonder how this is going to go. I, I have a little bit of a preamble, and the f- first thing I say is that when I sign off, please don't hang up the call. The internet needs a few seconds to finish, <laughs> you know, getting the files. Yeah. Number two is that we could talk business all day long, but consider this. What if... Like in my case, I often think about my sister. She's got three kids, all different dietary health considerations. So a family of five, she does a lot of grocery shopping. She wants to shop better for her family, but she has a lot to consider. And of course, you know, the, you can't just always spend all the top dollars on everything premium. So what would you say to her about your product? Try to humanize it around the yeah. consumer and so then when we jump into the questions and, you know, I, for the most part, have my questions prepared. Um, I, I, I have this fear of, especially when you're in a podcast, you're out loud, right? Like you, when, once it's out there, it's out there. And if I sound stupid, I just, my heart aches. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid of sounding like an idiot. So I do prepare I some of my questions. I don't know how you could sound like an idiot. I mean, <laughs> it's not, I'm very good at it. And that's because I can talk without saying anything. That's, that's where my, it, when I'm, uh, when I regress to my 10 year old self, I just talk without actually saying anything. So I have to be careful. But when I prepare for the podcast, I'm just, I'm trying to put myself and it's not that hard. We all go grocery shopping. We are all consumers. All consumers so yeah, I just have to take my CPG hat off yeah. and put on my like husband, dad, guy, with a green basket self yeah. and say, what would I want to pick up? What would I want to switch? Well, why to? did you pick it up? Why would I want to explore this? And, or for example, I was talking to somebody yesterday in my office about the, the Yucca app. And so I'm doing the quick scan and getting sort of a uh, considerations around, you know, the, the healthiness of a product yeah. and sort of learn it. So like, well, how am I going to navigate this as a, as a normal consumer and sort of, put that hat on. And so the conversations we get to have with some of the very same people is the same person, totally different conversation totally. because we're talking about it with, for the consumer. Sake. From it, it gets, it's all the angle, right? It's all the angle. Cause it is difficult. Like it's, you know, when you're walking in, I mean, at the end of the day, like I say, not everybody's a brand, but everybody's a consumer. Totally. So you're, you're tackling the, the side that if, if without the consumer, again, Phil and I have not much to talk about because there's not much going on. Right, because people have to buy the shit that that were that, that, that these stories are. We got some really cool stories, but a story is, is great, but you need people to buy into the story, which is the other side. There, I mean, the two of us have been pulling on this thread for a little bit um, because we 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 realize we don't know a lot about our own ecosystem. You know, um, the journey actually like three farmers might have been one of the first ones to kick it off for us, right? As we went, we know fuck all about farming. Like literally we know fuck all about farming. Like city, Toronto boy, right? He's He's got a little bit from the Kootenays and a little bit, <laughs> right? But um, we know, I, you know, so when we talked to Natasha, it was like the farming part, it was as fascinating as getting this amazing brand up and running, right? Um, but it started like, you know, make us undo, you know, kind of pull on a bunch of threads. And of late we've had, you know, we had an aquaculturalist on, right? Um, so you could kind of learn, we could learn a little bit more about like exactly what sustainable farming, like fish farming is, like all of those sort of things. We, we had um, Skipper Auto on um, because it was about, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're all these They're fantastic. That, Skipper Auto is fantastic. I know, right? And then, I like, love it. I just love the whole concept. You know, I love about all these things, right? And I think, your podcast will 
do an even better job, I think, of helping consumers realize. I, I'm not, you know, trying to shape your your podcast is going where it's going, and I think it's already amazing. I just think like helping the consumer understand some of the subtext in a consumer sort of way will allow people to understand what's happening. Like these conversations we're having about re retailers, consumers have no idea what's no happening, right? Like they have no clue, but they really do need to have a clue of what goes on in order to get shit onto shelves. Right. So, yeah. And I think that's where, and that's, I like that you brought that up. So I have yet to interview a retailer. I want to, they are not very responsive. <laughs> well, well, I can give you a couple. Oh, the the fifteen, sure, I'll, I'll take you up on that. The fifteen yeah. percent that don't uh, don't get back to me. Most of those are retailers, um, but that's because you know they're typically there's a lot more lawyers involved. <laughs> yeah. There's a, they're sort of more yeah. corporate controls around you know what gets said out loud, and and the retailers have been under such scrutiny over the last while. It's sort of a bit of a minefield, but. The reason why I think it's interesting that you brought retail is that I think from the consumer standpoint, they do want to learn a little bit. They want to be in the know, but we have, yeah. I have to be careful because you like, look how we could go into retail, right? We could hammer on retail. You guys, oh my God. <laughs> right? yeah. like, but I don't and, care. And I know just enough to be dangerous. Uh, but for the consumer's sake, you know, there's only so much that they can sort of take in. Uh, otherwise, it gets too industry too quick. It's too yeah. insider. It kind of goes beyond. So I do have to be careful there. But I, are you familiar with the magazine and uh, publishing house called Monocle? Yep. So when I first started thinking that, okay, I want to do a podcast, I thought if Monocle had a food insiders, like a CPG insiders podcast, what would, what would they do? If they were going to talk about the future of the grocery store, what would Monocle do? And so that's sort of one of the, you know, framework, uh, sort of uh, consumer facing thoughts I had was mm. I, I wanted to make a show that, that they would be jealous of. That's how I approach it. <laughs> so, cause that's about smart, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of, investigative journalism light yeah. <laughs> very light and i'm more yeah. comedic than i am you know uh intelligent but i think that it's important to take consumers behind the scenes but just to the point that it it's helpful for them to make choices i think that's the whole trick is that they don't need to understand listings terms who gives a shit that's that's an industry issue they need to understand that that fox up what comes on the shelf and can really influence what selection they get right to some degree but they, they don't need to know that you know what they need to know is they need to know that there are a shit ton of really great retailers out there who actually do give a shit and it's not the corporate ones all the yeah. big guys don't care i hate to tell you guys i mean we can talk about this all day we have like phil i've i don't care don't list my products i have products i love on the shelf you don't want to listen because you don't like what i say in the podcast don't list me couldn't give two shits because the independents will and they're in the communities and they do support their communities and they will if you're if you tell people listen if you really want to have a product on your shelf and it's go to your independent and ask them nine times out of ten first off you'll be able to talk to somebody and nine times out of ten they'll actually give you an answer of why they can or can't do it mm -hmm. and a lot of them will will try local people federal store lists interesting shit. those people that you showed are not going to get mass listings tomorrow morning unless they have an obscene amount of money mm -hmm. But they can get listings on all these cool little stores and they get you telling us about it. And now we're kind of curious, you know, this break a break this afternoon, maybe I'll hop over to Main Street, take a quick peek. You should it's you, interesting you shit. You right? buy yourself it's some freeze-dried vegan ice cream. Well, when I was talking with uh Rachel over at Cafe William, she was talking about how consumers are voting with their dollars. So yeah. only to the point that they feel like they understand enough or care enough to say this brand, this product is important to me and my fa my family or my household. And by purchasing it, I you know, I kind of felt that way about Moonshine Mamas, you know, a, a, yeah. quite a while ago before I really understood the benefit of yeah. that the looks or turmeric that they make and before i really got to know them as a team and it was it was like you know what i think i'm gonna buy it as a as an act of support yeah however that turns as soon as you start consuming a, a like a better for you product like a literally food is medicine product like moonshine yeah. mamas yeah it's like oh now i'm not only buying it to support someone who I, you know, like very, like, I just think they're amazing people and I love yeah. what they're doing. I'm like, 
I need that. I really love yeah. this. So, really but love now that. I'm voting with my dollars and I'm yeah, telling exactly. my local thrifty store with my purchase exactly. that, that product is important and yeah. I need to see it on shelf and I'm going to buy it every two weeks. Yeah. And you'll also tell your local Loblaws and Save On who don't have it by not shopping in their stores because they're not giving you the the the, the cool and the other stuff that's out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, right? so well, let's let well, you know what let's podcast is done. Aisle forty two, it's fun. Let's talk about. I want to ask you guys some retail questions uh -oh. here. Oh, uh -oh. okay. Okay, thanks I for have, stopping by. So this this no, is basically no. <laughs> I, so, Phil, I this will shut down all the new listing potentials we had about a minute ago. We'll have yeah, basically no, zero no. left. I'll, I'll try to be careful. I'll try to be ah, careful. Whatever. No, 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 no. We, we, Light we, it up. We didn't build this thing by being careful. So, you yeah. Yeah. Enjoy whatever. Well, well past that. <laughs> let's. Can we? Can we talk about sort of the the local? I love a good local movement. I think local is important. I want to champion local across the board. First off, there are some places in the world that can't just shop deal with local because they don't have the capacity to make things locally. They have to bring stuff in. So it's right. we we live in the land of milk and honey in a lot of ways. There are places like the Lower Mainland of Vancouver or Toronto or places in Canada where we just have access to a lot. There's a lot of growers, producers, yeah. manufacturers. Local makes sense in a lot of places yeah. in where we live and work. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of places that don't, and we should got to get off our high horse around local. However, in some of these larger grocery chains where they really, you know, they do their local banners and they have their local programs and maybe there's government funding to support some of this local stuff. Um, I Sometimes I feel like these special displays and these special highlights of local, it's almost like that's the expensive corner or that's the weird stuff that we can't put anywhere else corner or it looks like it's a feature but yet I don't see and an, there's one in my local store I'm going to try to be vague for a second because I don't want to be mean but there's a big local display with maybe like 10 products that are all quite local and I don't see anyone going over there I don't see any product moving off the shelf the display always looks totally untouched right I don't get it but they can say local yeah, sure. They say it, that's but it doesn't but that's, do that's, anything. But that was the intent. Like you got to do now the other way. The intent wasn't necessarily to do anything or sell anything. A lot of times what large, large retail will do is to do that. You know why? Can't say on the news, I don't do it. Can't say I didn't support. I got signs. But if you look at it really and truly, their stores do not, the message of one end does not, does not resonate with the other 85 ends in the store and the 14 aisles that are 80 yeah. feet deep. That's not, you had one end. That doesn't def, doesn't make you local supporting. It makes you just have a local end because nobody can say, well, Corbin store is not local. Oh yeah, sure. Look, I got an end. That's all local. But it just seems like such a waste of resources. A waste. And it's a complete waste. Like I think, why about, do you have a local set? Why don't you put me in the aisle? They, uh, the retailers are always you know, saying like every inch is just so expensive and so it difficult. Is. You got to fight for it. And then they've got this huge local display. That's in the like the master children that have been forgotten. And it's I just, in the middle of nowhere, Corbin. it's not expensive real estate. Typically they typically put you in a spot where it was a dead hole. Anyway, you want to support local and you want to help local as a retailer, like truly as a retailer. So, you know, the law of laws and the Sobeys and the saves, you want to really do it, put the shit in the aisle. I got a local cereal. Don't put me in a local set in the back corner of produce okay. or bread. Put me but in the I don't know if that washes for me because if, if it's not like, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is yes, we're hard on retailers, but I'm not sure that that's entirely a retailer problem. Like I think there's a consumer problem that in a lot of ways it's to me, it's not different than greenwashing from the consumer side, right? Like every consumer that you talk to says, I want to do what's right for the planet. I want to buy. I want to buy you know, local. I want to buy. Well, I, I want to buy environmentally friendly products. I'm willing to pay more for recycling. I want ethically sourced, blah, blah, blah. And I want to buy local. But then when you get to the store and you vote with your dollars, we, we know that the consumer doesn't necessarily vote that way with their you know when it comes to dollars they will choose the cheaper option yeah 75 percent actually 79 percent say that they will shop more sustainably right. but only 24 percent do right. that gap right. but it, i think the local thing is the same you guys the challenge is though is first off walmart's not local costco's not local loblaws is not local local canadian maybe 
But, you know, when you start looking at it from a grander thing, you need to also pick your retailers. Local, federal store is local. Um, Longos is local to your neighborhoods. They might have got a little bit bigger. Um, you know, uh, uh, Fresh Street is local. Right. But let's, let's go back to what yeah. you said about the dead zone. So that makes sense to me that a retailer says, okay, this area of our store, this footprint is underperforms. Yeah. It's difficult. Right. The way the traffic flow, we right. just can't really, we can't win there very well or people blast past it. So let's just, we'll use that space as our local space. Aren't there consultants and advisors that can tell a retailer how to change their store so that they don't have dead zones? You're always like going to have a dead zone, though. Like There's always places where people don't go, and it doesn't necessarily matter. I think the retailer's obligation, like if you look at like truly the independence, if you go into Ferrero's, if you go into Trail and go to Ferrero's, you got to have on your show courtroom because Danny would talk. But he's, And if you go into a store like that, they support a wide variety of international goods and Canadian goods. But they'll support local day in and day out. Peter's Yig in Kelowna. Peter supports local. And not by just saying, oh, I support local. Peter brings in local players and puts them on front ends. No, no, but, but, okay. yeah, but I think this is where I'm still, uh, normally you and I are on the same pages, but I'm not, right? Like, because I'm not sure if I fault the retailer. Like, so if I'm not a local retailer, if I'm Walmart, Right. Yeah. But I bring in a local set, regardless of his dead zone or otherwise, right? Is I'm still doing I'm still doing something that's health that should be theoretically helpful for the brand, right? As your local brand, I'm bringing you in. If if you want me to bring you into the set, Kenny, I can do that. But if you're not going to sell off an end, you're not selling off. I understand that, Phil. You're, you're not that's giving, that's me, that was you're giving me an end. You're giving me a shitty end. So basically, if you're going to handcuff me and tell me to go swim, I might be able to tread water because my, only my hands are handcuffed. But sooner but or later, you in set, you're also swimming. You're in with 2,000 I get it. other you know what, though, right? Listen, it's not a retailer's obligation to support yeah. anybody they don't want to support. Yeah. My thing is this. If you're going to tell me you're going to be local, and we have a bunch of local retailers, large, that support local. Horseshit. They don't support local. They tell you to support local. When you go down the main parts of the store, if you want to be a supporter of local, put the local cereal next to the national cereal or international cereal. You want to try, and if the local doesn't make it, gun it. I'm not if saying you hang not on. Gonna get it off, if it's not going off display, how are they going to make it beside you know it? Why? Because again, if you give me display in the middle of nowhere, what's the difference? If you If you put ice cubes in the middle of the Arctic, yeah, it's good. You gave me display, but nobody wants it. Okay, you guys are gone. You guys have gone cage match on me here. <laughs> However, I think you have. That's think, it. This podcast is broken up. Oh my god! Oh my gosh! I love it. You guys are crazy. So okay, the I think you know what? Maybe hear me out. And this has been a journey over the last few minutes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's been bumpy. Yeah. I think from maybe from the marketing side, I it's these dead zones, Kenny. That yeah. That's uh, maybe that's the bigger issue. It isn't that they fill it with local, and that I feel like local and it's is not being every undisturbed. Store does it. That's not no. Fair you're right. Everybody does that. But I look at that and go, and maybe we've seen that. You know, you've seen how like David's Tea and Starbucks and some of these other brands they're doing um in what's that what's that called where they sort of do a a display within a, a shelf store within a store. A store right? within, thank you. I meant I, I yeah. knew that a store within a store. Maybe there's a, a way that. And and maybe it's the local play that can help kind of drive it. But man, mm -hmm. I would love just can I can I imagine five years in the future or yeah. I don't know, maybe sooner. Yeah. Sooner. Imagine like an ethical food group like store within a store. And we can actually yeah. draw people in right. to a space where, okay, yeah, maybe that is a dead zone or it's a whatever, but it's a display, uh, it's a a space in the retail experience that shoppers and consumers can get excited about and have tr and, and real trial, like not like mm -hmm. hair nets and masks and plexiglass mm -hmm. and tongs and paper cups, like actually like eat and enjoy or consume or uh, just have an experience that is just more human and not forgotten and sort of the bastard that's child. Of that's, that's the retailer's thing. If right now, like stay away from anything experiential because no retailer is going to go build a set with all this fancy shit. They're going to come to the, to the vendor to build it. So you know, you got to be willing. Yeah, but I'm a vendor. You got to really, you got to pay to play then, yeah. right? Because that's okay. a whole different world of retail. Now, now I'm fundraising. Of what a retailer can do very easily <laughs> right now, though, 
any retailer in this country, if they wanted to support Canadian or whatever province or city they're in, they can move things on their shelves in their stores to accommodate that wish if they so choose. Most don't choose it. They will find the easiest place and typically those are not in the best parts of the store. So you do get your displays and you do get an end. But if you go into one of our local retailers and you get the bunk of local, which is typically toward produce, not the worst place in the store by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a haphazard shopping experience. So first off, you gave me great real estate, wasn't a dead zone, but you put me into this chaos then nobody can understand. Therefore, the shopping experience isn't great. Therefore, nobody's going to shop it. So you haven't done anything. You haven't, you, you, you half-assed it. Yeah, you, you gave local. I can take a picture. I can show you. I can show you it's not dead space. I can show you it's a great area of the store. I can do all that. And then we can have the discussion, well, it doesn't sell there. It's not going to sell anywhere. Well, you know, a peanut butter next to a, 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 next to a detergent, next to an environmentally friendly scrub brush, let's be serious. Who the hell's shopping that chaos? But maybe that's, that's also, but maybe that's on us, like the folks in the middle. Like so all three awesome. of us, we, we play we play different parts in the retail ecosystem because for national retailers that play on national brands and big brands, maybe we need to be giving them the tools to say, look, like you know, because if you if you're if you're as long as they're willing, Phil. As long as they're willing. But I, I think the thing is is we don't we don't know that they're unwilling, right? Because they've, they've, regardless of the space, the spaces, it costs them money, right? Even a That's dead it. space, low turning, you know, All whatever you want to call it, right? Is that dusty shelf, it costs them money for them to put that, that end up and to bring that stuff in. So maybe it's on us to be able to say to them, guys, like, here's how you do, here's, here's what you don't know that a local retailer knows, right? So like Peter at Yig's, he knows what to do when he brings in a local brand, right? He knows what he's got to say. He knows where he's got to promote it. He knows what he needs to do to push it. If you're a national player, I don't know if you necessarily, I don't even know if you necessarily have the mechanisms, right? Like, I don't know either. You know, I guess the whole point was then, but yeah. then don't scream local. Don't tell me you're doing your part just by virtue of, of freeing up a piece of real estate and saying, here's the picture I can show you on the news, I support local. I think that's sort of where it kind of started from. I, I don't disagree with you. It's not It's not incumbent mm -hmm. on any of these people. You know what's incumbent on? Is the people who, who are on Corwin's show. You have the money in your pocket. You choose to spend it where you choose to spend it. If you all shoot, choose to shop Walmart, don't piss and moan about local. Listen, you you are already the wrong page, all like, the retailers that might want our product, and then you started yelling at all the national brands. Now you're yelling at all of Corwin's audience. Like I'm not yelling. I'm just telling people, at the end of the day, if you want local, <laughs> shop local. Yeah, yeah. You can't shop a, yeah. a multinational who carries multinationals and then sit there and say, well, I like to shop more local. I wish they had more local. Well, what are the local stores? They have it. 75% who say you want local, you're willing to pay more. And then if you belong in that 50% that don't actually back that up, like you are at fault for sure, right? Because right. there are brands looking at those numbers going. Exactly. You know what? That's three of four. Fault at that point know, either. Like retailers three looking at four Canadians are, you know, three out of every four Canadians are willing to do this if I switch to something sustainable. And then, and who does four Canadians show up and buy my product? Like exactly. you're going to drive our guys bankrupt, right? Like that's exactly. actually going to be a major problem, right? Exactly. And who's going to be left? All the big guys who all aren't, the big guys because yeah. retailers well, aren't going to support it. And why should they? Don't don't. Yeah, we have to be careful. I mean, the consumers considerations they uh because they're on the bleeding edge of every dollar yeah uh, right they they can only make so many choices uh, you know so they we have to the what expectations we put on them does need to be tempered i think it's on as you know as vendors in in the system i think it's it's important for us to keep the conversations you know honest and and candid ultimately it comes down to inspiring consumers motivating consumers yeah, and meeting them where they're at that they might not be able to make a jump because the thing that they love is now 
150% more because it's made local. Like that's just right. not going to, yeah, that's right. not going to work. You know, that's just bad business though. Yeah. So that's, that's not the fault of the consumer. No other industry talks like this, by the way, right. like, Oh, exactly. we should charge 10 times more because it's made down the street or it's made with, you know, compostable plastic. Well, that's nice and all, but who in their right mind would make that switch? Exactly. Speaking of switch guys, I have a, I have a call I have to get to. Oh, you got to go. <laughs> I got to right. go. I Let's actually have to go. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. We'll catch up yeah. another time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here.